Leslie Marmon Silco's heritage is Native American, Mexican American, and white. Uh, she identifies strongly uh, with the Laguna Pueblo, uh, which would be her native ancestry. Um, and I think one key to understanding her works is the fact that she was not completely accepted um, among the Laguna Pueblo, and that I think to some degree she felt marginalized um, as a Native American. And in talking about her works, I think it's important to understand a little bit of uh, history of New Mexico. Um, so when the Spanish um, settlers, some would say colonizers, um, arrived in 1598, um, they encountered what they perceived as two different classes of Native Americans, two groups. Uh, one, for example, would be the Navajo, um, who were hunters and who took up large areas of land in pursuing um, elk and deer and other game animals. Um, they really sort of uh, didn't have one central uh, home base like a town, uh, but rather were a little, little more nomadic. And the other uh, group, which the Spanish named the Pueblos, Pueblo is a Spanish word for village or town, uh, were people who had made settlements and who were farmers. And these people, by and large, uh, were less likely to have weapons as they weren't hunters. Um, and they, to some degree, were more amenable to the Spanish as some adopted Spanish customs, the Spanish language, and even Catholicism. Now, to some degree, this adoption of Catholicism, for example, was by force, but not entirely. To some degree, it was a matter of survival. But again, not only. I think uh, there also was some idea of a sort of unity of culture um, that was the result of this conquest. Um, so Spanish influence uh, begins in New Mexico in 1598. Um, important to note that there was a huge revolt called the Pueblo Revolt in 1680 in which members of the various pueblos um, who didn't always get along so well, uh, united in order to uh, basically kick out the Spanish, um, which lasted for a couple of decades until the Spanish were able to sort of regroup and reconquer the area of New Mexico. Now, this area was under Spanish control. Um, it was an extension of Spain as New Spain, and later uh, Mexican territory when Mexico gained independence uh, from Spain until the Mexican-American War, in which the United States uh, invaded northern Mexico in 1846. Uh, the war lasted uh, just under two years, um, and the result of the U.S. Uh, invasion was that the areas of New Mexico, uh, along with Colorado, Arizona, Nevada, and California, um, and parts of Wyoming and Utah, uh, would go on to become U.S. territories. Uh, and this was a status, it was a territory, New Mexico was a territory, uh, until it gained statehood in 1912. Um, interesting to know that from 1848 until 1912, U.S. was not granted statehood. Um, and it wasn't until uh, New Mexico and Arizona um, had a majority of uh, white, uh, English-speaking uh, Protestants uh, who would then go on to become the voters, was the logic, um, that these places were able to become states within the United States. Now compare that to California, uh, which gained statehood in 1850. Now this was a result of the gold rush in 1849, um, in which thousands, possibly millions, um, of people came from the East Coast, white people, and on the main they were uh, Protestant and English speaking. Additionally, um, there were huge waves of migration from all over Latin America, uh, from China and other parts of East Asia, um, into California, which really meant that the population of California had drastically changed um, after the Mexican American War. Uh, now, that's a contrast with New Mexico because New Mexico didn't have gold. And unlike Texas, New Mexico didn't have cotton. So these were this was not an area that was highly sought after 
uh, for the general American population. In fact, what New Mexico had for the most part, um, holding up its economy, was sheep herding. Um, and we see several references to sheep herding uh, in Silco's work. So the result of all of this is that New Mexico comes to be known as a land of three cultures. It's an oversimplification, of course, uh, but the sort of mythology around the area is that you have the original Native American uh, population. Uh, you have the Spanish conquest and the descendants of the Spaniards and later Mexicans, who call themselves Hispanos, or the Spanish word for Hispanic. Um, and then you have white American culture, um, the sort of three layers of culture that exist in New Mexico. And primarily, these three cultures, um, not only uh, in Silco's own life, uh, but in Silco's works, are the ones that are interacting, and sometimes in more violent ways, and sometimes in ways that represent more of a compromise um, among the cultures. And I say compromise, in particular, I'm looking at the Mantis End rain clouds, um, in which I see a definite conflict um, among the Catholic tradition and the Native American traditions. Um, but I also think a larger uh, point to this story is the reconciliation between this conflict and some type of compromise. So on the one hand, we have a character like Leon, uh, who represents the Native American Laguna Pueblo uh, spiritual traditions. And to him, I would say his motivation is that he wants to preserve these traditions. Now we see this in uh, his reaction to Teofilo's death. right? So Teofilo um, passes away at the beginning, and we see that Leon and Ken uh, perform this ritual um, in which they paint his face, um, the use of cornmeal and pollen um, are extremely important um, and I think very symbolic uh, in this tradition. And ultimately this concept of uh, sprinkling water over the grave um, used in with the idea um, that the water will ensure that he won't be thirsty, Teofilo won't be thirsty, um, and that he, he can send rain clouds uh, back to the community and sort of provide for uh, the living. Um, and this is all steeped in a Native American spiritual tradition. Right? On the other hand, we have a character like Father Paul. Now, of course, as a priest, uh, he represents the Catholic background. Um, and we see that he's described as having blue eyes. And we see that he is not from New Mexico as he sort of wonders, you know, how can you dig into frozen ground? Oh yeah, this is New Mexico, um, and things are a little bit different here. And according to Father Paul's tradition, uh, the right thing to do upon Teofilo's death is to perform the last rites ritual and to have a funeral mass. And this is really the motivation from which Father Paul acts. And I think there's a tension uh, between these two characters, and it can be a little bit subtle uh, this is not a story about violence or two characters really going into extreme conflict. Uh, but we do have this great scene where Leon comes to see Father Paul, and Father Paul tells him, You should have told me about Teofilo's death. Leon responds, That wasn't necessary. And Father Paul's reaction is, For a Christian burial, it was necessary. Uh, so the tension is right beneath the surface here. Neither one's going, you know, head to head in an extreme or, an or in a violent way. But each one is acting from a specific cultural background, right? And I would say in the end, um, there's a real compromise that is reached. Uh, for Leon, it's a compromise in using holy water and having Father Paul present um, at the funeral. And for Father Paul, there's a huge compromise in the fact that the holy water is not used for a Catholic ceremony as he understands it. Uh, so both of these characters are, to some degree, able to fulfill their cultural needs um, and to some degree are compromising as well. And I think the character Louise uh, really represents that compromise uh, because she's the one who suggests that not only should we sprinkle water as part of this ceremony, uh, but that it should be holy water and that we should involve Father Paul um, in this ceremony.
And I see lots of other signs of the cultural compromise between these two groups. Um, I love the detail that Teofilo is a shepherd, um, and that when Leon goes to visit Father Paul and we see on his door, uh, we have a, a representation of a lamb. Lamb with a capital L there. Um, so this is a reference to the Lamb of God, or to Jesus himself. Uh, but I think it also shows that, you know, Teofilo's occupation um, is extremely important within this Laguna community, um, but also for Father Paul within his tradition, the imagery of the lamb, uh, which is just a young sheep, uh, is extremely important in his understanding of spirituality. Another symbolic representation that I find um, of the cultural compromise uh, is the use of colors. Uh, we have a great moment at the beginning um, in which Leon and Ken are performing this ceremony on Teofilo's uh, deceased body. And we have a description of the colors that are painted on his face, on his eyebrow, above, uh, be below his nose, um, on his cheeks. And later, when Leon is visiting Father Paul, the exact same colors are used uh, to describe the sofa, the lamp, um, and the surroundings. <coughs> So in other words, colors that have extreme importance within this Native American tradition are also associated with Father Paul. Of course, Father Paul's name is extremely meaningful here. Um, in the Bible, Paul was Saul of Tarsus, uh, who was a convert and who became an apostle of Jesus, uh, who spread the gospel uh, in the ancient world. And really, he was known as one of the most influential uh, evangelists, and that he converted, uh, you know, many people. And when we look at uh, Acts within the Bible, and when we look at the epistles, which are the letters uh, written to kings and other leaders of the ancient world, um, really it was a message that was meant to uh, convert. And that is Father Paul's role here in Laguna Pueblo, right? You get the idea that his motivation is not only to preserve his tradition, but to uh, extend it and to some degree evangelize and convert um, Native Americans to Catholicism. So he tells Leon and Ken, we missed you at Mass, we would love to see you. Before he realizes Teofilo is, is deceased, we would love to see Teofilo at Mass again. Um, and there's a moment when he's looking through uh, his magazine, a missionary magazine, um, which features pictures of the pagans and the lepers, uh, which I think might show that his understanding of conversion um, is a little bit misguided, perhaps, or a little bit outdated. Um, I think Leon and Ken's names um, are also meaningful uh, in the simple sense that they're anglicized names. Um, I see them as much more American-sounding than Teofilo, for example, uh, whose name is Spanish and who would have represented the bridge, I think, between the Laguna Pueblo and Catholicism and that Spanish Catholic tradition. There's a great moment uh, when Father Paul looks up and he sort of reflects on the bells above the church. And uh, we get the information that these bells are from the King of Spain, uh, which is absolutely true. The King of Spain... Um, basically authorized uh, the construction of churches in each of New Mexico's 19 pueblos. Uh, so if you go there, right in the center of the pueblo, you're going to see a Catholic church uh, with Spanish uh, architecture and design and Spanish Catholic imagery. Uh, so I think there's a lot of layers uh, to the cultural compromise that's happening in this story. Um, of course, not all of Silco's stories focus on compromise, and I don't think they're always optimistic. Well, they do center around uh, a cultural conflict. So in Tony's story, uh, we see a few of the same characters, actually, who are represented in the Mantis and Rain Clouds. Uh, for example, we have Leon, uh, who is just back from the army, and his army jacket is referenced very briefly in the Mantis and Rain Clouds. Um, and I think the conflict here is a little more overt. Well, clearly, there's, uh, there are acts of violence throughout this story. Um, but I also think it's 
the legacy of this cultural interaction among these three cultures. Early in the story, we see a reference to the procession, which is carrying San Lorenzo, or St. Lawrence. It would be um, a statue or a representation of this Catholic icon. Um, this is also an issue of cultural confluence. Right? And note that Tony calls him San Lorenzo and not St. Lawrence. Uh, by the way, according to tradition, uh, St. Lawrence brought the Holy Grail, or the sacred chalice of Jesus, to Spain, or to what is modern-day Spain. Um, and he also represents charity in terms of giving alms to the poor. And he is the patron saint of makers of wine and beer. And I think this also subtly uh, gives us a hint into um, how this Catholic iconography influences our characters, right? Since we have Leon and Tony who are drinking alcohol, and we even have the elders um, of the Pueblo stating that if they don't want to uh, have violent interactions with the police, then they shouldn't be drinking alcohol, right? As if that justifies uh, the police officer uh, beating on these uh, members of the Laguna society. So the conflict here, um, we also see it in the fact that the, the police officer, who's the antagonist, uh, is a state cop, right? And we sort of see the, the levels of power. The tribal police have no power uh, when the state cop is present, um, and his violence really is sanctioned. So I'd say he represents um, sanctioned violence, impunity, um, and oppression um, on part of the state, right? And authorized oppression. Um, in my opinion, one of the most important lines here is when Tony um, is talking about Leon, and he says, I wondered why men who came back from the army were troublemakers on the reservation. Now, remember, I just said that the police officer represents this state-sanctioned violence. And we have to look at that in light of the fact that Leon, um, given the time in which this was written, uh, I would say has recently come back from Vietnam. And that he has likely witnessed um, death, violence, blood, and many uh, soldiers returning from Vietnam experienced a certain mistrust um, of the U.S. government um, and the reason that they were sent there uh, in the first place, which is why I think Leon says things like, we're just as good as them, um, and that maybe he's a little fed up um, with being treated as a second-class citizen um, in a country that he has fought for. Um, and I also see uh, Leon's decision to choose a modern weapon in the 3030 over uh, Tony's um, arrowhead. Now, Tony offers him an arrowhead and says, this is uh, for protection. And Leon rejects that idea. Leon has gone through some type of change in which his cultural tradition is not strong enough to provide protection for him, especially against the, the state. Uh, I'd say so. So I'd say to some degree, he is fighting fire with fire here. He's fighting the state with uh, a weapon. <clears throat> of course, it's significant that Tony himself is the one who kills the police officer and not Leon. So why is Tony the one who kills uh, the cop? To some degree, I would see this police officer as part of a larger system of oppression and authority. And I think Tony feels like he has no recourse. Right? Remember, Leon says, we're just as good as them. Tony, for his part, feels fear um, until he eventually decides to commit the murder. Um which indicates that maybe he doesn't believe that he's as good as them, at least in the eyes of the state itself. Um, so yes, I would say that he feels that the violent act is the only recourse that he has. Um, and he has that uh, famous last line, right? That they can take on strange forms. 
So what is this it that he refers to taking on a strange form? Uh, seems like perhaps a spirit, um, a shapeshifter, and I think to a larger degree, a system of oppression and a system that does not value Tony's Native American heritage and traditions.